us at our Mechanics Institute online program, Shakespeare's Essays, sampling Montaigne from Hamlet to the Tempest with author and scholar Peter Platt with, in conversation with, Philippa Kelly, dramaturg in residence at the California Shakespeare Company. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at Mechanics Institute. And tonight, we're very pleased to co-sponsor our program with the California Shakespeare Company. For those of you who are new, Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. It features a general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and our cinema lit film series on Friday nights. So please visit our website. Also, please note that the library is open Monday, Wednesday, Friday for a few hours every day. So you can make your reservation and come down to the library. Um, it's a thrill to open our doors to our members once again. You know, after this talk, we will have a Q&A. So hold your questions and put them in the chat. And uh, we look forward to engaging with you. Um, also, Shakespeare's essays, sampling Montaigne from Hamlet to the Tempest by Peter Platt is available at edinburghuniversitypress.com. And we have that in the chat on the side and books are at 30% discount with the discount code NEW30. So Peter Platt provides a detailed history of the literary critical interest in the Montaigne Shakespeare connection from the 18th century to the present day. He explores both authors' approach to self, knowledge, and, the, and form that stress fractures, interruptions, and alternatives. While the change in monarchy, the revived interest in judicial rhetoric, and the changes in Shakespeare's acting company helped shape plays such as Measure for Measure, King Lear, and The Tempest, his book contends that Shakespeare's reading of Montaigne is one of the driving forces in his later plays. And we are delighted to have two great experts and great minds to discuss this. So please welcome Peter Platt and Philippa Kelly. And I forgot to give you their bio. So once more, I'm gonna give, give a few minutes dedicated to their bios. Uh, Peter Platt is the Anne Whitney Olin Professor and Chair of English at Barnard College. He is the author of Shakespeare and the Culture of Paradox and Reason Diminished, Shakespeare and the Marvelous, and the editor of Wonders, Marvels, and Monsters in Early Modern Culture. He has written articles on Shakespeare, Renaissance, Poetics, and Rhetoric, and Shakespeare's Montaigne, and an edition of selections from John Florio's 1603 translation of Montaigne's essays was co-edited co with Stephen Greenblatt. And Philippa Kelly is resident for dramaturg for California Shakespeare Theater. She has published 11 books and 98 articles. And her latest book is uh, edited, that she edited is called Diversity, Inclusion, and Representation in Contemporary Dramaturgy, Case Studies from the Field. She is proud to lead a year-round community theater group entitled Berkeley Theater Explorations, the purpose of which is to make dramaturgy foundational to community theater appreciation. In other words, to make theater going an active practice rather than a passive form of consumption. Hooray, hooray. So please welcome Peter Platt and Philippa Kelly. Take it away. Thank you. Um... It's uh, it's great to be here. Um, I want to say I, I I don't want this to be like a Renaissance text where there there are twenty pages of preambles, but I do want to thank everybody out there for coming. Uh, it's overwhelming to see the people I am seeing who are not necessarily in San Francisco at all, um, and I can't I can't see more than twenty of you. If we were doing this doing this at the Mechanics, it would be preferable in many ways, but there'll be a lot of people who are here now who couldn't be here, here. And I am in the Mechanics Institute uh, <laughs> because I have an office here and I've written three books here and um, Laura and Pam have hosted me 
for all three of them. And I'm incredibly grateful. I'm also grateful to my office mate, uh, uh, Bill Lipman, who listened to me talk about this in this office for 10 years and to Philippa Kelly for taking time out from an incredibly busy schedule to actually read the book. And because we've talked a little bit about it, uh, uh, she's read it carefully and thoroughly, and I'm inc incredibly grateful. I have to thank my wife, Nancy, and my son, Jordy, for living through uh, the Montaigne Shakespeare years with me. My brother, Jeff, the same. My mom and my dad for making me interested in books and scholarship. My colleagues at Barnard uh, for always being there with me and, and, and talking with, through these ideas with me, especially William Sharp and Peter Connor, who uh, have, have spent hours with me on this. My friends in the world of Shakespeare and Montaigne, especially Leonard Barkin, Stephen Greenblatt, Jim Shapiro, and the man in the center of my screen, Will Hamlin. Um, and finally, my editors and promotional people at Edinburgh University Press. If you wanna write an academic book, it's the place to go. I'm incredibly lucky. And now I will stop with that and let Philippa rip away. Uh, what, let me know, what, what, what do you wanna talk about? You're, you're muted, my friend. Okay, I'm sorry. Hello, yep. everybody. It's just an honor to be here with you all. And uh, Peter, you thanked me for reading the book, but it was such an honor and a gift to read the book. I loved it. And it's written, everybody, in such a personable style. Um, but I wanted to begin by, well, first of all, giving a shout out to Professor Greenblatt, um, who wanted to be here this afternoon, but is hosting another uh, event of his own, as well as Professor Shapiro. And, um, and I know both of them have been uh, key collaborators in your uh, academic career, Peter. But first of all, how did this particular project come about? Well, I, I, that's, I think it's a good place to start. And, and the mechanics was part of that too, uh, because it, it ended up being a two-part project. Originally, I was gonna do a sort of case book uh, for teaching for the classroom where I would talk about the history of the Montaigne Shakespeare connection um, and, then, and then have uh, case studies where I would get into the, the conversation pairing essays and, and plays. Um, and, and, and then that would be one part. And the other part would be, you know, um, sort of an addition uh, of, of the translation that Shakespeare read. And the hybridity of it, although hybridity is good, Montaigne and Shakespeare love hybridity, they love mixture and messiness. The publishers didn't. <laughs> um, they basically said that's not gonna. That's a great idea, but it's it doesn't fit a market. And another one of my great colleagues at Barnard and Columbia, Gene Howard, said, "Do two things: um, do an edition, and and then do the monograph." And Gene's almost always right. In fact, she's I probably always write about these things. So I listened to her, and the problem was that Stephen Greenblatt was doing an edition of. Florio's essays as well, and his if my, they weren't going to coexist. I mean, that's, he's, he's he's his was going to was going to uh, win the day. And so, knowing him from the way back, I asked him if he wanted to collaborate, and he did. And that was part one. Uh, and that's in 2014. The mechanics was nice enough to have me give a presentation on that, which is called Shakespeare's Montaigne, which is a selection of slightly modernized translation. Um, of Montaigne that John Florio did um, and that Shakespeare and his contemporaries read. Then I finished that and, and I had sort of started writing the other book and that's what we have now that with Shakespeare's essays is, is that other part, which is the history of the connection between the two writers, which in print didn't start until the 18th century. I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, and then the second, the, the bulk of it is um, paired essays and plays. The, the, we'll eventually get to The Tempest, which is the obvious one, the smoking gun, the one that has to be in there. But I think a lot of the pairings I've done are, if not original, then barely new. Um, making the case for the importance of um, Montaigne to post-1603 Shakespeare. Um, so that, that's, that's 
the origin of the, the project. It was going to be one thing, and then it became two things. Mm -hmm. uh this is a little bit of an odd question, uh, but I just wanted to know for our audience, what did Montaigne look like? Oh, uh, I, I don't have a slide. I have a slide of the translator. Um, wait a minute, I can pull this out. Uh, the reason he's not, uh, goodness. Um, unfortunately, I'm in my office, Phyllis, so I, it shouldn't be too hard. Um, God, where's my, where's Will? Oh. Um, he looked a lot like Flory. This is you. You must have thought I was going to have a slide here. Uh, where's where's the biography? Okay, that is that is what he looked like. Oh, that's uh, that's one of that's one of the portraits, and that's going to have to do. Um, that's another one that is fairly recent. How about that? If I were in this office, I'd be doomed. Yes. <laughs> Um, that's my, that's what Montaigne looked like. Um, and, uh, um, so that's, that's yeah. for that one. And I can, while we're at it, I can practice my screen sharing skills. Um, that's not the one. No, I don't want that one. Sorry. Uh, that's what John Florio looked like. Um, and he was the amazing translator dictionary maker, language manual uh, creator, probably translator of Boccaccio's Decameron as well, um, who took on the project of translating um, uh, uh, Montaigne's essays from French into English. Mm -hmm. That's Florio. Well, let's, thank you for that, Peter, and, and uh, sure. sorry to, to uh, yeah. discombobulate <laughs> our, our process. No. Uh, but so then I have another question. Shakespeare didn't write any essays and, and, and that we know about. Um, and I, I'm just wondering, I'm showing everybody the book here. Uh, how would you explain the title? So the title being Shakespeare's Essays, Sampling Montaigne from Hamlet to the Tempest. Great. Um, that's a good one. And I can also say that Part of the reason that I couldn't easily find a portrait um, <laughs> uh, is that I decided not to put portraits on my cover. Uh, I instead wanted to do the places where the two men worked. Um, so one is the incredible uh, ceiling of Montaigne's tower, which I recommend everybody here go to see, but make sure you have a reservation in Castillon because they don't take very many people. And if you go in the summer without a reservation, you can go a long way uh, in your pilgrimage and never and, and not get there. Montaigne's favorite quotations were on the beams. The other, the inset is the earliest uh, uh, illustration we have of either the curtain or the theater early Shakespearean stages. So that's, I, did, I didn't put their, their selves there, which would have been easier for that first question, um, but I put their workplaces. Um, and now to the language part of the title, um, right, Shakespeare didn't write essays. Montaigne didn't think he was writing essays either, which is really interesting since there are no, once he did write them and call them essays, they be, it, it, it became a literary genre, right? And Francis Bacon, inspired by Montaigne, called his essays, essays. But in, in the, that moment, and we're lucky enough, Florio has an incredible two dictionaries, English, Italian, but in a kind of parallel project was done by a man named Randall Cockrave. And in 1611, he published a dictionary of the French and English tongues. And he's really useful many, many, uh, for many reasons, particularly when you're dealing with with uh, Montaigne and Shakespeare and, and French and English in this period, but he defines uh, essayer, the verb to what we think of as to try, but essayer in French still has uh, in English, the sense that was very prominent then of assay, right? Weighing, sampling. But as Cotgrave said, to, es to essayer, to essay, try, prove, taste, attempt, take a taste make a trial of to feel beforehand. And so for me that there's a, there's a 
pun there. It's a play. It's tricky, right? It's not overly clever, I hope. But the idea is both to be destabilizing. Wait a minute. Shakespeare didn't write any essays. But then to remind us that essays cut both ways. Shakespeare's essays are the Florio translation, right? That book of essays that I think were really important to him. But more interesting linguistically, I hope, is the idea that Shakespeare essays, tastes, samples, tries out Montaigne's essays. That doesn't mean he always agrees with him. It doesn't mean that um, he, he mirrors him or steals from him, though sometimes he does. He negotiates, he tries things out. And I was really frustrated at a certain point in this project, and Will Hamlin knows this, because I couldn't, there was, there's a, uh, I tried to find a middle ground between finding verbal echoes, which you have in, in The Tempest, but that, that's kind of barren in the end, between verbal echoes and on the one hand, very, very precise and minute. On the other hand, an anything goes link, which gets very sloppy. They both were skeptical. They both were interested in selfhood. They both were interest, it, interested in cultural others. All these things are true, but how to get in between that so that this was a kind of, uh, uh, their, their nego that negotiation could, could, be, could be made clear. And for me, the essay, the verb essay, essaying was the key. So Shakespeare's essays are Florio's translation, but also Shakespeare's samples. And I also kind of like the hip hop thing. Um, I, I kind of like that, that echo of, of, of hip hop and sampling because Montaigne takes texts from all over the place. Renaissance writers did that. Sometimes they were accused of plagiarism by bitter people, but, but that was weaving a text out of other people's texts. Sampling in that sense was also part of the game. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, it's also really intriguing that the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche claimed that Shakespeare was Montaigne's uh, best reader. Is there one piece of, of clear cut evidence that Shakespeare actually did read Montaigne? Yeah, there's there's at least one, um, and that's that's what I would want to focus on because even the skeptics, because there are people that say, well, everything, almost everything that Shakespeare talks about that seems Montanian is part of a commonplace um, culture, as a, a, a you know, a, a, a bag of classical ideas and um, aphorisms that uh, that that anybody could have had access to. I think that's really, it's very negative. I don't buy it. I, I respect it and I have to negotiate with that and answer it. But even that type of critic can't deny that uh, there's a smoking gun. Um, and, and, and I just wanna show it to you. Um, we got Florio again uh, coming up, but the next slide is, the page from of the cannibals uh, where we that where Shakespeare actually did quote in the in the voice of his character Gonzalo uh, from from the tempest uh, in in the tempest from of the cannibals and this is the passage right here that's not so good uh, you just have to believe me but this is better um, it is a nation, what I answer, Plato, that hath no kind of traffic, no knowledge of letters, no intelligence of numbers, no name of magistrate, nor of pol uh, politics superiority, no use of service, of riches, or of poverty, no contracts, no successions, no dividends, no occupation but idle, no respect of kindred but common, no apparel but natural, no manuring of lands, no use of wine, corn, or metal. That's Montaigne via Florio. And here's Gonzalo, uh, written by Shakespeare. Had I pl a plantation of this isle, my lord, in the commonwealth, I would by contraries execute all things. For no kind of traffic would I admit. No name of magistrate. Letters should not be known. Riches, poverty, and use of service. None. Contract succession, born, bound of land, tilth, vineyard, none. No use of metal, corn, or wine, or oil. 
no occupation, all men idle, all, and women too, but innocent and pure, no sovereignty. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing now so that um, I can see more people. Um, and there you are again, happily. Um, but uh, it, that's a case where to me, it's fascinating. I, I need and want that evidence. Take that doubters, there it is. Uh, but what's more interesting is what shaped, and I think we're gonna go a little bit chronological, I think, and we'll talk about the Tempest towards the end. But I think the essaying of, of the cannibals is more interesting than that verbal echo. It's fascinating, you know, Shakespeare wants to think about starting a, a, a commonwealth or a state from scratch and what that would mean, and he draws on Montaigne. But I think there are many more things going on in Of the Cannibals, not, not the least of which is the title and the near anagram of Caliban um, that, that is even more interesting than the direct, the direct echo. But that's what I would say. Nietzsche is right. Nietzsche wanted a broader, a broader reading. I totally agree with him. He didn't pick it apart. He just threw it out there. I think he's right. And my book tries to prove um, that that Montaigne was was sort of everywhere, particularly in the late in the late plays, mm. post sixteen or three plays. And we'll talk about dating if we get there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, which reminds me, Peter, um, could you say a little something about the dating of Shakespeare's plays, about how we work out, um, given that um, that there weren't um, document, you know, there wasn't documentary evidence of the plays after his right. death? Yeah, and this is hard stuff, um, and, it, and I'm not, this has become quite a, a science now. I, I want to say a couple things about dates, um, and 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 that's definitely answer your question. One is that although the, a, a key date is 1603, right? That's when that's when the translation came out. Um, it's amazing how quickly the educated, literate uh, uh, Elizabethan Jacobeans um, gravitated towards those essays. As Will Hamlin shown, the most the, the the playwright who drew on Montaigne most and most early was John Marston, a contemporary of Shakespeare. Um, uh, ben Ben Johnson alludes to uh, people stealing from Montaigne as early as 161011 11 um, uh, in in Volpone. I think that's 10 11, 10, 11, 12, 13, somewhere in there. Um, so those are early uses of uh, uh, of Montaigne, and then, but people didn't, in at least in print. I mean, so Montaigne was out there in English culture. People were dying to have it. They, some of them could probably read French, but then the English that English translation came out, and it was a big deal. Um, but when did people start linking Montaigne? And I promise I'm going to get to the place. I just while we're on dates, I just thought we'd line things up a little bit. Um, when did people start to notice that Shakespeare, Shakespeare himself drew on Montaigne or drew on Montaigne, uh, Montaigne's ideas? And the first time in print it was noted was in 1780. And this is what Laura, Laura mentioned, the 18th century. A man named, a man named Edward Capel linked that, bar, that, that text that I just showed you in The Tempest to, uh, to Montaigne, though he assumed Shakespeare could read French. And this is another thing we may or may not have time to talk about. In 1790, Edmund Malone, the great editor of, of uh, 18th century editor of Shakespeare said, he just, he laughed at Capel. He was very mean that people could be mean. Uh, they, the barbed wit, 18th century. Uh, and he said the passage was pointed out by Mr. Capel, who knew so little of his author as to suppose that Shakespeare had the original French before him, though he almost literally followed Florio's translation. Well, that's 1790. So the link between Shakespeare, Tempest, and Montaigne is 1780. Shakespeare, Tempest, and Florio, 1790. Um, so those are important dates. Uh, and now, now, what about dating of plays? That's not, that's a great question. That's not my, my job. It, it, it's, a lot of it's done by stylometrics and computers now and people you know, get in bloody verbal 
<laughs> well, they would probably hurt each other if they got in the same room. But the, the verbal spats and disagreements about the dating of plays, uh, some of the people involved in that, in that, in that um, discipline are, are not particularly kind. And it's a kind of slightly macho uh, uh, one-upsmanship. But it does matter. Dates do matter in this area, which is why Philip is asking me this, I think. It matters because um, what happens, when can you, if, if you assume Shakespeare did not know French, and it's interesting to me that my French colleagues across the world think he did, why do you, why do you have to start at 1603? Shakespeare obviously knew French. He was drawing on Montanian ideas before that. I said, man, I wish you could tell my Shakespeare people that. They're incredibly empirical and positivist about this. So that's, I think they're right. But for the purpose of this argument, I had to start in 1603. Then the question is, aha, and people will say to me, you put Hamlet in there. Well, most people do put Hamlet in there because of the attention to um, skepticism and, and the problem of knowledge and the problem of the self and the problem of knowing other minds, all that stuff seems completely Montanian. And yet we know there were versions of Hamlet performed before 1603. So what do we do with that? I have to argue, and I do, though I realize I'm vulnerable on this, that, that the later versions of Hamlet Re revised the earlier version of Hamlet. And there is a, a, a the, what the so-called Q1 or first quarter of Hamlet, a very different play. And if Shakespeare, uh, if that's the earliest version of Hamlet, um, then that would be very interesting. It's definitely a, a, a less sophisticated, much shorter version. I love it, but it's more of a, a pure revenge tragedy. Shakespeare's Hamlet gets deeper, more complicated, I would say more Montanian in the revisions of the second quarto, 1604, and, and the first folio of 1623. People disagree a lot about this. I, I, I look at the whole problem of the Hamlet text. It's the one part of the book that's a little slow and scholarly, but I had to do it because I have to convince people that that's a possible starting point for the, for the Montanian Shakespeare. Um, so uh, people, you know, I am not, I don't have the technology or the skill to date Shakespeare's plays, but I have to pay attention. And All's Well That Ends Well is a play that I just, in terms of its sensibilities, its language, its ideas, seems to me a, a quintessential Montanian play. There used to be an argument that it was an early an early Shakespeare play and like a 15, 1590s play. The, the, the latest research suggests not only is it not that early, but it's in, in the sweet spot, 1603 to 1607, perfect for me, makes my instincts or validates my instincts on this. And that the new stuff is that maybe Thomas Middleton added to it uh, in, you know, in the 1620s after Shakespeare's death. That's, that's where there's contest about, about all's well that ends well. So for us, for my purposes, uh, the plays I look at are post 1603. So Hamlet, all's well that ends well and measure for measure, 1603, 1604 for me, maybe as late as 1606. Uh, King Lear, 1606, 1607, 1608 with the revision, 1623, uh, uh, that, that ended up in the 1623 folio, sorry. Um, uh, and then, and then um, uh, The Tempest, um, which is a late play, 16, 10, 11, something like that. And you also have a little, you have a little scintilla of The Winter's Tale. Um, so just to, to kind of add that to, to uh, your pile. Yeah, for uh, sure. So uh, I'm wondering... What do you think? One question we have right now that is asked a lot, and I just heard George Saunders talking about this a couple of days ago. What do you think Montaigne and Shakespeare thought about human beings' capacity to change? Oh boy, yeah. Um, 
that's 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 a big one. It's a really really important one. Um, I think the key term in the period and the way I think about it is and a real interest in human mutability. Um, and, and I think, and, and the idea of a discontinuous or kind of multiple self, um, that, and that gets connected in Montaigne to the idea of a performed self or the theatricality of the self and a shape-shifting kind of um, a sense. Shakespeare is really obviously really interested in that as a man of the theater and as um, uh, someone who took the, you know, the theater of his every day and thought about it as a theater of the world or theater, theater of, of, of life. Um, in in um, a, an early-ish essay, in the first edition of Montaigne's essays, um, of uh, Inconstancy of Our Actions, um, Montaigne, and this is in Florio's translation, which is a little bit hard to get, but, but I love it. And I, 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 it, it responds to this. Montaigne says, we are all framed of flaps and patches and of so shapeless and diverse a contexture that every piece and every moment playeth his part. And there is as much difference found between us and ourselves as there is ourselves between ourselves and others. That's an astonishing thing for someone to say in the 16th century, it seems to me. There's as, there's as much difference in me, in between versions of me, as there is between you and me, right? Um, and there's that, there's a sense of tailoring there, clothing, flaps and patches, shapeless contexture, but also theater. Every moment playeth his part. Montaigne finishes that little bit by saying, esteem it a great matter to play but one man. It's hard to be one. It's hard to be singular. And I think both Shakespeare and Montaigne um, at different moments in different plays and different essays think that that singleness is good or that singleness is limited that multiplicity and mutability is exciting and that multiplicity and mutability are scary, that constant change. Um, that the idea that as, as one uh, anti-theatricalist who also wrote plays, Anthony Mundy said, that you could be as variable in your heart as you are in your part, right? Um, that that there, how could you know somebody if they could constantly change clothes and therefore self? So there's that, capacity for change, which I think, again, they, they alternately found exhilarating and frightening. Um, and then just the, the general beauty of a recognition of human mutability and mortality. Um, so you were constantly in change and then you died. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a beautiful part in Montaigne's longest essay called uh, Apology for Raymond Saban book two, essay 12, if you want to look it up. But that this is just one of my favorite bits and one of Florio's most lovely renderings. The flower of age dieth, fadeth, and fleeteth when age comes upon us, and youth endeth in the flower of a full-grown man's age, childhood in youth, and the first age dieth in infancy. I mean, that's Beckett, right? I mean, uh, and yesterday and this in this day and today shall die in tomorrow and nothing remaineth or ever continueth in one state. So if, you, if that's sort of the grounding, um, the, then that's sadder, it seems to me, more poignant, but also incredibly realistic. And more often than not, both in Montaigne and in Shakespeare, the, the ability to change shape is a as a positive thing, or at least a powerful thing, particularly when you get into politics. The people who are single, often Rome at single, and that means unified, one thing, uh, univocal, as as we say in the trade sometimes. Those people are more limited, particularly in the world of politics. There might be a kind of grandeur to them, and they often are Roman, um, but they're also there's also a kind of limit. Endless change is also scary because, as I said before, how can you know somebody if they're constantly in flux? So there's a lot, of, a lot of change. They wrote about it, thought about it. The theater gave Shakespeare a way in, a kind of practical on the way to philosophical. And Montaigne, as a philosopher, drew on theater a lot. So they, they really did. Um, they really were connected, I think, on, on that topic. 
Mm, that's fascinating, Peter. And just thinking about, um, so just for the benefit of our, of our audience, um, there was an Italian called Castiglione and he wrote about decorum. And so um, in, in that period, the idea of sumptuary laws predominated so that you your task in life was to fashion yourself um, into the correct and integrated version of who you were ordained to be. And so just thinking about that, it's interesting, isn't it, that in our time when we, 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 we have so much more of an idea of an internal core that is our true self. And so ideas like trauma, you know, not parts of the self that can't be integrated and then being two-faced is another way of, um, of that we have of not really being comfortable with shape-shifting. And that's what's so beautiful about what you're saying because I feel that in a way, maybe Shakespeare and Montaigne, and I think Professor Greenblatt would certainly argue this, might have been much more comfortable with that idea that we are as different from versions of ourselves as I am from you. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's right. And Castiglione was definitely um, involved in the idea of the self as a work of art and it's something that needed to be practiced so much so that you couldn't then see the, the hard work behind it, the sprezzatura. Um, but for him, and I think you know, there, uh, the good courtier and Shakespeare gives you good courtiers and bad courtiers, but the good courtier uses all that performativity and skill, but also tells the prince when he's doing a bad job. Um, so there's a kind of moral quality to it. There's, there's fear, and you get that in the more Machiavellian side of things, that mo morality goes away with shape shifting, and I don't think it has to. I don't think it has to at all. And and also because you know I we're now we're up against it here already. But um, this is something that Shakespeare brings changes on in his transvestite plays, his, his cross dressing plays, right? Where that was just fundamental part of the theater. Uh, boys played women, um, but he used that to meditate on and had people switched several times sometimes in the classic plays like Twelfth Night and As You Like It to, to think about gender and gender performativity too. And so it was long, it was like, Judith Butler's great, but Judith Butler didn't invent it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Laura says we have 10 more minutes. So uh, this is all very exciting stuff and I need to, uh, to rein it in. So um, I know you have more questions. Well, I, I'm loving the fact that you're letting it loose um, in relationship to what you've been saying, Peter, um, uh, so there's a quote from Montaigne, the weakness of our condition causeth that things in their natural simplicity and purity cannot fall into our use. And it makes me wonder, in, in, and this is actually page 82 of Peter's book, um, it makes me wonder about the idea of scepticism and where Montaigne and Shakespeare sit on the um, continuum of, of skepticism. Yeah, this is, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're touching all the bases. Um, this is big, big stuff um, and really, really important. The essay that that comes from is, I think, to me, my favorite Montaigne Shakespeare um, uh, link, which, which, which isn't the Tempest one and the Cannibals, but is we taste nothing purely because Montaigne talks about the blended nature of the world in terms of selves and morality um, and, and philosophy uh, that um, the, my mom just entered the waiting room. That's just really <laughs> wonderful. Um, uh, and um, the, the, uh, the 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 kind of blendedness of the world and that that gets it definitely does get into skepticism and Montaigne absorbed uh, a, a certain strain of, of ancient skepticism and disseminated it I think you know arguably more than anybody else in in that part of the 16th century because um, uh, 
Sextus Empiricus, and I'm, I'm not gonna try not to go too far into the weeds here, but Sextus Empiricus wrote in about 200 uh, CE, but his, his uh, outlines of Pyrrhonism, an intense form of skepticism, didn't come out in Latin until 1562. And he was drawing on the ideas of Pyrrho, who was um, from the late fourth and early third centuries BCE. Um, and Montaigne was really, really interested in that particular form of skepticism. Um, he said that there, in, in, in the Saband essay, the big one, with, it's almost a book, it is a book length essay, 212. Montaigne says, whosoever seeks for anything cometh at last to this conclusion and saith that one, either he has found it, the philosophical quest is over. And he called these people, including Aristotle and Lucretius, whom I love too, dogmatists, because they thought they had uh, an explanation of how things work, the end of knowledge, that it cannot be found the other extreme, what Will Hamlin calls uh, anti-dogmatists, but the idea that you can't find truth at all. Uh, the idea is, I know what truth is, I can't find truth at all. And what Montaigne preferred was this third term, the Pyrrhonist, outlines of Pyrrhonism, what Sextus was, was getting at, which was that he is still in pursuit after it. So Montaigne, although broke with the Pyrrhonist view in, in, in lots of different ways, that ongoing inquiry was crucial to his skepticism. Doubt everything except God, and I, I really do believe Montaigne when he says he was a, 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 a practicing Catholic. And if you go to his tower, right beneath his library and his workspace is a little chapel. You know, it's hard to believe that was just uh, performance. Um, but this, this idea of doubting the doxa, doubting the, the common uh, way of looking at things. So, they, so Shakespeare and Montaigne, I think, share a paradoxy, right? against the, the doxa. Um, their skepticism is not nihilism. It's, and it's also not as hopeless as what got connected to Cicero, that second group, right? Where all I know is that I know nothing. But there was, I'm, I don't think I can get it. I don't know if I can get it, but I'm going to keep asking and I'm going to keep pushing. And it was that kind of skepticism that I think um, is liberating and exciting and, and Mon Montaigne and Shakespeare both gravitate more towards that kind of uh, uh, I, um, freeing skepticism, um, endless inquiry later in their careers. I think it comes out more in book three of the essays and then, and then in, in Shakespeare's later plays. Mm. Um, <clears throat> gosh, you know, there's so many things I want to ask you, including uh, ideas of uh, women's roles, of men's perception of women. Um, but I'll just go to the chat and see whether uh, we've got questions here because uh, everybody, I have already gotten Peter's agreement to come and talk with me out at the Cal Shakes Grove when we actually have our production out at the Bruns uh, in August. And so I'll get the, the chance to, to ask even more questions then. But I want to give you a chance to have a voice. Elaine says, um, another translation of, of essay is rehearse, which is useful for writers of books and of plays. What of the relationship between Thomas More and Montaigne and how More may have uh, extended onto Shakespeare? Oh, I, that, that, that's a tough one that I don't, that sounds like two, I mean, the rehearsal thing's really, really interesting. I'm not sure how Thomas More fits in though. I think of Thomas More, the, the connection I think of is when Thomas More talks in the utopia. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so we can still talk about women and we can still talk about the Tempest because I think yeah. Pam's going to do the, do the chat, but, but, but let's take it. More's really interesting in, in, um, and I, maybe this is where the question was going, but he, he and Raphael dispute whether you can be a courtier, where you can play the game. And Raphael says, now I'm, not, I'm taking my, my knowledge and I'm leaving. The court is corrupt. I want nothing to do with it. And the more character says, you have, you have to play. You have to play that part. You have, to, um, you have to engage because that way you can change the theater. That way you can change the theater of state. 
That way you can change the prince's ideas. So more in, 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 in that way, I think is much closer to Castiglione. And that doesn't, that, that put aside how more dealt with uh, people in, that he disagreed with religiously. Um, but that's how I would think about it. Just quickly, I mean, I, I think, I, I, I just, I like the, the women idea. And I really, before we go to the chat, I mean, maybe it's in the chat, but I, we got to talk about the Tempest before we say goodbye. But just to say about the women, Philippa, that's, it's such a big question because I would say that's where Montaigne is less our contemporary. Um, uh, he, we, we had a Shakespeare Association um, seminar about Montaigne and Shakespeare. And one woman said, you know, who, who was running, it said, no one's really taken Montaigne to task for his, his attitude towards women. And, and it's true, we like, give him a pass. He's much more enlightened, shall we say, or much more philosophically open to thinking about uh, cultural others, Brazilian Indians, um, uh, religious conflict, even, um, you know, the idea that God has to look like a human being. He's, he's fascinating if, um, uh, he's, he's fascinating on animals and whether an, animals have consciousness. He's sort of the father of the, of the animal studies movement. He seemed to be the father of the animal studies movement. He's so radical and wide open, but he's not particularly, um, he's not particularly generous, at least at times to women, even though he had, uh, he loved his daughter. One daughter survived. He had a female executor who, who took care of his, um his book uh, his, his publication of his book after he died and got got late revisions in doesn't say too much about his wife some of the things he says about sex are a little bit crude and not particularly generous shakespeare's takes montaigne's ideas of going against the grain and in many plays not all plays he can be misogynistic too troubles the idea of of patriarchy and I don't think Montaigne does that. They're different. And that's one place where I think they're different. I think Shakespeare takes Montaignean strategies and pushes them into gender um, in a way that, that, that Montaigne doesn't, or at least doesn't very often. And maybe the theater gave him that angle, the performativity of gender and things like that. Mm. Um, also, I just have to squeeze in something about, well, firstly, um, about the sonnets, um, would there be anything you would uh, you would want to say about the sonnets? Obviously, most of them being written um, before the 1603 translation, but any particular relevance of the sonnets to Montaigne? I think some there's some ideas in there which which may be Montaignean, some some skepticism and some um, nature nature culture tension, but I haven't done a lot of work on it and I, I do, I, I haven't, I think soliloquies, uh, I think the soliloquy in Shakespeare changes, which isn't quite the same thing, but it's, it's related to kind of uh, a poem that's sort of a solo project. Um, I think the solilo soliloquy in Shakespeare changes after he reads Montaigne and Leonard Barkin and I have talked about this uh, a lot that, that the, the, in, the kind of complex inwardness that you get in, Hamlet and Macbeth and Lear soliloquies are just different from those that you get earlier. That doesn't mean Richard II soliloquies aren't incredible. And they also think about some of the same ideas, but I'm not sure about the sonnet. I am more sure about the soliloquy that that changes post 1603. Mm. And then we have to say something about the Tempest a little more because um, it's so fascinating. Your, yeah. your treatment of it. Yeah, well, thanks. I, that's, that's very daunting because there's so much good work that's been done on it. Um, what the standard take is, which I disagree with now, I have to say, the standard take is Montaigne's very kind of, I think, radically, uh, this is not a take, this is true. He's, radic he's radically um, uh critical of, of Europeans and celebratory of the Brazilian Indians that he's met. He, he turns it into a, a nature culture tension and talks about the falsity of culture and civilization 
um, and the the idea that there, there's no, there's nothing in that nation he says that is barbarous unless you talk about what you don't understand and don't know as barbarous. I mean, there's that kind of incredible stuff in that essay. Um, and the idea is that the the typical take, which I used to agree with and dis, and and disagree with, I think more now, is that Shakespeare's too wise for that. So he turns his cannibal Caliban into um, somebody who you can't who you can't put into that you know uh, natural uh, uh, enlightened you know savage. Um, uh, noble savage position earlier before the letter um, because Caliban's complicated and Montaigne's Brazilian Indian is simple and Montaigne therefore is naive and Shakespeare is is sophisticated and clever and I just don't I don't buy it anymore I think both of them Montaigne highlights the the violence of the cannibals the vengeance of the cannibals he definitely sees them he, t he wants to take down European pretension through the cannibals, but they aren't saints. And similar, similarly, Caliban is a would-be rapist, but he is also an incredible poet. He's arguably the, the best poet in The Tempest. He's multilinguist, and he's mastered uh, <laughs> Jacobean blank verse. Um, Montaigne talks about the beautiful songs and poems of the cannibals. So for me now, what I would say is that both of them meditate on the beauties and violence of nature and unadorned civilization. They, they meditate both on the beauties and violence in nature and the beauties and violence of civilization and culture. Shakespeare's not going to say, and I don't think Montaigne says, oh, he's hard on Europeans and um, and 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 what he sees as over adornment and ruining of the natural world, but he 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 sees the beauty of art. Montaigne does, Shakespeare does too. Caliban can can threaten Miranda's virginity, but he can also write the one of the most beautiful speeches. He can speak one of the most beautiful speeches in in Shakespeare when he laments what is lost, he laments, um, he, he, he wants to go back to sleep so he can dream again. Um, and so to, to me, they're closer together in their double approach to the cannibals and the Calibans than, than I used to think. Mm -hmm. um, Montaigne's very, it's an early critic. Um, he's an early critic of European colonialism. He's even harder on Europeans in uh, of coaches, which is his other his later essay that takes up a similar topic, um, Shakespeare draws less on that than than he does on the cannibals essay. I, I just find that fascinating, Peter. That um, you know when you talk about um, so the, the the way that and we think about this a lot right now, the labels that we give each other are often so um, contrary to the views we might have of ourselves. And it takes me back to your point from Montaigne about different versions of ourselves conversing with each other and sometimes finding um, enmity with each other. And, you know, we can see that um, in the way that uh, different versions of Caliban's self are presented to himself yes. by the other characters in the play. And one senses that he really doesn't know even how to um, respond to those. Uh, I mean, when when Prospero accuses him of um, of trying to rape Miranda, he says, "Well, I I wish I had peopled the whole aisle with Calibans." Right. He's a, he's not he's not repentant, and I think you know on some level, he he doesn't know. I mean that that's a case where that that law that custom um, just doesn't doesn't apply. I'd say I'd say your another example to take it out of that cultural other space is is Hamlet who hates versions of himself that we might 
find valuable, right? There, Hamlet's another is a self-divided person in the way that you were talking about it, right? There's the Hamlet that that is the, the skeptic that hesitates to commit violence, that hesitates to murder, that Coleridge thought was weak. Hamlet himself thinks that he's weak. Part of him hates that version of himself. So, so you do see, and, and Harry Berger's been great about this, characters um, having arguments with themselves. Uh, I don't think Caliban does that, but Shakespeare allows us to see multiple versions of him, for mm, sure. Mm. And it's interesting, isn't it, that at so many of the close of Shakespeare's great tragedies written in that first decade of the 17th century, he has the protagonist doing battle with the different versions of himself right up at the end of the play. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Mm. <laughs> So now, Laura, should we, um, we've gone over, but I just, we needed to get to the Tempest, I thought. Um, uh, we're, we're ready for uh, questions Bam. from the audience. So uh, if you have questions uh, from our audience, please uh, put your questions in the chat and Pam will read them out. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll go back to more conversation with both of you. Well, the first the first question I see is actually from Laura. Um, which play has the most influence from Mont Montaigne, and specifically, what themes or characters? Um, it, that's a hard one. I mean, for for I think for me, I mean, there it's hard not to say the Tempest because, as I suggested early on, I think there's so much in the Tempest that is shaped by of the cannibals and the, and the verbal echo is just the start. Um, the meditation on the Brazilian Indians and, and, and uh, the idea of nature and culture, uh, the tension between uh, unadorned uh, nature uh, and, and culture, poetry, civilization. There's also beautiful, beautiful discussions of islands um, which are relevant to trying to situate the, the, the Tempest, um, quite literally situated. Uh, and and this, um, that the larger just meditations on um, people that you don't know, uh, people that are utterly different from you. Having said that, as I suggested earlier, to me, the linchpin essay is We Taste Nothing Purely because that is... Uh, could be a watchword for both of these authors, right? There's nothing that is pure, simple, certain. That's why Montaigne didn't like the dogmatists, right? That's why Shakespeare, particularly in the later plays, think of Anthony and Cleopatra, takes down the Romans and dares to celebrate the variety and, and the complexity of Cleopatra, a woman from Egypt, right? As opposed to, I mean, she's by most definitely the, the the character that gets the power in that play and is the, is the most appealing even to Eno Barbas. So um, I would say we taste nothing purely um, as an essay and then and then those those um, problem plays that I link to them um, which are blended things themselves measure for measure and all's well that ends well that pairing I think is probably the one I'd lean on. Can't ignore the Tempest, um, and then and then something like Anthony Cleopatra comes in uh, and and picks up on a lot of these ideas later. Also, could we also add uh, Othello, the Anthropophagi, yeah. um, the cannibals that do there's cannibals that each other eat, the Anthropophagi, and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. Right, and, and Othello knows that if you're, um, it, it, if, you, if you don't have that in your traveler's tale, people won't believe you. If you don't have a marvelous creature as part of your traveler's tale, this Sir Walter Raleigh put this in, in his, his Guiana text. He said, uh, the Blemmy, the guys with the head in, in the chest, I didn't see them, but I talked to a guy that I believe just down the road and he says they're here right um so so there's 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 that um quality too uh that um it 
that that there there there's something marvelous that has to be there for the truth. But Montaigne actually met these Brazilian Indians who were cannibals. So that 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 gives it an extra an extra layer. Mm. But Othello counts for sure. There's a there's a question from Nancy Fee. Are there passages or scenes in Shakespeare's plays that seem particularly informed by Montanian and possibly more Catholic notions of virtue and vice? Well, I live with that person and we've never had this conversation, but um, I, I, that I, the one I'd say, and not that, not to be a dead horse here, but the one that, that strikes me f fully, and it's not a Catholic one, but it is the, the, we didn't get to talk about political power, but the the king in All's Well That Ends Well has an amazing speech in which he self-consciously talks about the limitations and the fictions of, 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 of royal power. The king in All's Well, and this to me is is a is a, a Montanian idea, but it's, it's just shocking to have a king say, look, if you put royal blood and noble blood and common blood into a bucket, you could not tell the difference. We are all, we're all similar. Montaigne has lots of riffs about this and we didn't, we didn't get to talk about it, but he, he talks about the difference between a commoner who might be an actor and a king is clothing. The king in All's Well That Ends Well says there's no difference if you put it there's blood it's in it's indistinct i can make this woman because the bertram doesn't want to marry helena he says because of her class he's i can elevate her class the main thing you need to think about and this is where nancy's question is pertinent um uh, is her virtue right she's a good person the blood thing doesn't matter now bertrand tries to deny him. Uh, he says, yeah, but I just don't love her and I never will. And then the king says, okay, I'm the king. You have to marry her. He eventually has to play the royal card, but it's clear that it's conventional. It's clear that he has, as people might've said uh, uh, 20 years ago, he deconstructs the idea of blood, deconstructs the idea of nobility and royalty. He, he's left it in pieces. And then he has to put it back together and exert royal power. So mm -hmm. to me, that King's speech is one of the one of the great moments of 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 Montaigne and Shakespeare, at least idea wise. Not linguistically there; there aren't linguistic echoes, but they're deep seated uh, parallels of ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a question from Newstock. You've helpfully discussed the near direct quotation of Florio's Montaigne in The Tempest. Can you speak a bit more about Montaigne's practice of weaving quotations into his prose and how that practice either resembles or differs Shakespeare's practice of quoting favorite sources, whether directly or indirectly? Yeah, uh, they're in different genres. That's a great question. I think that's Scott. And thanks for coming, Scott. Um, they're, it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, Scott's written an incredible book about all, all, all this. Um, it's, they're different genres. I think Montaigne is more overt um, in, his, in his pastiche. Um, it's harder to find sources in Shakespeare. Um, Montaigne puts it right out there, sometimes by flagging them and sometimes not by doing that. Shakespeare's He's writing a play, so you don't want to do that all the time. Montaigne's not necessarily showing off, but partly showing off. It's kind of a bravura performance. That's where I think the sampling comes in. Um, is he's putting together as, as, as you know flaps and patches. You stitch together a self. You stitch together a text. Um, and I think that that Shakespeare is a playwright, and he stitch he stitches together parts. That that to me is the parallel. Um, and yet Shakespeare clearly alludes to, um, particularly in the Roman plays, but he, he, he clearly alludes to other texts uh, um, uh, as, as well. It's, it's the stitching that I think is more similar than the way that they quote, um, but that's a great question. 
Um, a question from Carol Verberg. Along with the similarities between Shakespeare and Monta Montaigne, how did your comparison of them enlarge your view of one or both, both ideas? Ide I, sorry, what's the idea? I thought you were going to say the author. One or both side. Oh, let me see. Make sure I'm reading. Of one or both ideas. Along both with the ideas. I got it. Yeah. Um, I. That's great. Ed, that's a very good question. I think that um, by by the end of the project, um, I, I I think of Shakespeare learning first and foremost a method from Montaigne. Um, and what I talk about in the epilogue are ideas of Shakespeare's that were always there, um, even before the even before the essay, uh, uh, before the essays come out in English. Um, and then how some of those ideas get get transformed. I think what links them and what was more clear to me after doing the project that links them is a resistance to dogmatic thought, um, uh, resistance to what I've called before the doxa, the, the, the way um, received wisdom and truth. Um, and a sense, as I also suggested earlier, of a kind of peace with unknowing, a kind of peace with an ongoing inquiry that that definitely shows itself at the end of Philippa's favorite soon to be on stage winter's tale, um, where there there where everyone goes off with unanswered questions. It seems to me that ending is very Montanian. We don't know, even the audience doesn't know exactly. Um, what happened to Hermione in those 16 years that the uh, Leontes is going to ask a lot of questions off stage. And that's the kind of I, the kind of view that Montaigne gives you, particularly in of experience in, in the later essays in book three, that um, that there's that that inquiry goes on until we die and then we can't ask questions anymore. Um, there is no end in our inquisitions, he says. Our end is in the other world. And that if you, if you stop doing that, you're not living. If you stop questing, searching, accepting ambiguity, doubleness, and multiplicity, then you're, not, then you're only half alive. Um, and I think that connection between them, and I think Shakespeare shares it, was more clear to me after doing a deep dive into this project. So another question, again, is from Nancy Fee. Could you comment on Montaigne's concept of play as individual whimsy, caprice, or exploration, or as a mode of interaction between characters in Shakespeare's plays, if that's relevant? Yeah, I, I, I just say what I said at the beginning, which is something that, I, that Will Hamlin has worked on a lot and that I agree with, which is that there are a lot of theatrical metaphors in Montaigne, and um, he uses he uses the the theatrical metaphor to think about selfhood, and also to some extent um, the, the the uncertainty of the world and and the imperfection of knowledge. Um, so he 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 draws on he draws on the theater. Uh, not so much in the sense of play, but he draws on the theater and, and acting and shape shifting as a way of talking about selfhood. So that, that, that there's not a sense that that um, theater is absent from Montaigne at all. He uses he talks about actors and and play acting a lot on the way to thinking about the self. Okay, uh, I notice that Rosalie Weaver has her hand up. Oh, excuse me. She stepped away now. Um, when when she comes back, we'll we'll. Here uh, I am. Okay, Here Rosalie. Am. Yes, I'd like to get the birth and death dates of both writers, please. Sure. Um, Montaigne was fifteen thirty three to fifteen ninety two, and Shakespeare fifteen sixty four to sixteen sixteen. 
birthday tomorrow. Yeah, birthday and death day, supposedly tomorrow. St. George, St. Geordie's books, uh, dragons, uh, all kinds of things. And Ms. Weaver also, Florio, interestingly, 1553 to 1625. Florio lived, uh, outlived both of them. And I think the people that do these sty stylometric things now, uh, analyses, um, think that Florio didn't stop with translating Montaigne, but went on to translate um, Boccaccio's Decameron, which if, if he did was his, was his final masterpiece. Uh, he's, he's an amazing man. And we need, I can't do it. I don't have long enough left in me to, to write a Florio biography, but we need a new one. Um, Francis Yates is great, um, but we need a new Florio biography because he's, he's one of the most interesting men of his generation. He's right up there with these guys. He's just, uh, he's, uh, he, he was an amazing man of letters. Just a pitch for John Florio there. So I don't see any further questions in in the um, in chat. So okay, I, I mean I could take another from Filippo, or we can say goodnight. I'm 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 tired, but I love this stuff. So whatever whatever the bosses think. Laura, you're you're mute. You're on mute, Laura. Uh, Philippa, do you have a, a last question that you're burning to ask? I have so many questions that I'm burning to ask. Um, I, I guess if I had to choose one, um, I would ask um, about if you have a comment about the limitations of human power that could be uh, usefully compare the two yeah i um that that is something that they both very much uh very 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 much interested in i talked a little bit about it um with i wanted to i had a quote here at, uh i think it's page 98 is it peter uh, i i i singled it out for the group just in case we got into power. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't, I don't see. Um, the king, the, the king in, in all's well is, is, in a, is an example. Um, and this is a case where Shakespeare, I think, meditated on these ideas before before he read Montaigne. And I think Montaigne probably gave him, a, again, the toolkit and in a way of, of, of honing his ideas because Shakespeare, particularly through the theatrical metaphor, um, talked about, was interested in as early as that second group of uh, history plays, the way in which kings um, uh, performed their power, that there was something uh, the theatrical about, about it. Uh, and, and that, you know, you think about Hal talking about ceremony, the only difference between him and a commoner is that he's got the accoutrements of, of, of power. Um, the king in All's Well definitely, um, the, the king in All's Well definitely makes that point uh, about blood. Um, and um, I, I had some really great quotations uh, from from one of Montaigne's essays, uh, but I am not finding it at the moment. Um, where did that go? It was, it, was, it was great. But Montaigne does talk about the fact that you don't know the difference, you, you wouldn't know the difference between a king and a, a commoner without, without the props, mm -hmm. with, without um, the, the displays of, of, of kingship. So it's fragile. It's performative. Um, there's a there's a real challenge to the idea of the divine right of kings, right? If you're if you're thinking about that, and um, both the king himself in that blood speech, and uh, and Helena's challenges to the king when she's trying to get him 
to um, listen to her uh, suggests that um, the divine right of kings is uh, is potentially a, a fiction, um, which is dangerous stuff. I mean, yeah. no, no, nobody singled out um, the particular king, or that that could have been that could have been more of a problem. Um, and Peter, I, I think I've got this from your your book in the right place. And sit we upon the highest throne of the world, yet sit we upon our own tail. Yeah, that is a great one from from book third uh, from book. Uh, I'm tired now. Book three, essay thirteen of experience, right towards the end. I mean, Montaigne and and Montaigne talks about, um, you know, even if you're on the throne you're on your ass, right? Mm -hmm. And in and in All's Well That Ends Well, I think significantly, uh, the king has a terrible problem that's threatening to kill him, which is almost certainly a fistula in Aino. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, if you want to link those, you can, but the king can't sit on his throne. Montaigne's king at the end of, uh, of experience sits on his throne, Montaigne, Shakespeare's king and all's well and as well at the beginning until Helena cures him, can't sit on his throne. Um, and, and so I think that that's key. And I have found my, my, my other quotations just because they're interesting. I think this is from of the inequality that exists between us. Uh, Montaigne says, whereas if we consider a cottager and a king, a noble and a handy craftsman, a magistrate and a private man, a rich man and a poor, an extreme disparity doth immediately present itself unto our eyes, which, as a man may say, differ in nothing but in their clothes. And he goes on to say, for as actors, you shall see them now on the stage play a king, an emperor or a duke, but they are no sooner off the stage, that, but they are base rascals, vagabond abjects and poorly hirelings, which is their natural and original condition. Even so, the emperor, whose glorious pomp doth so dazzle you in public, view him behind the curtain and you see but an ordinary man. It's like shades of Wizard of Oz, right? But you see an ordinary man and peradventure more vile and more silly than the least of his subjects. It's contingent, it's chance, it's convention that brings power. And what that's Montaigne, I think Shakespeare found that and loved it. But the fact that he has a king of France say almost this, say something very similar is, is astonishing. And that's why to me, that, re, that moment in Oswald well, the Ends Well is incredibly radical. Uh, we have time for just one more question. And that's uh, from uh, Trish Gorman. Uh, it's about how we know what we know and whether Montaigne and Shakespeare were unusual in their day to be thinking about that question. Great, great question. I don't think they were un, I don't think they were unusual. I think that Montaigne's essays hit home the way they did because he articulated those questions about the problem of knowledge in a way that particularly in Florio's lovely English uh, uh, hit home. I think they found articulation in, in, uh, in his essays. And, and then I think also in Shakespeare's plays. So I, so those ideas were around anybody that wants to, you know, um, uh, challenge my ideas or, or the original, certainly the originality of these ideas certainly can do it. There were all kinds of uh, books that books out there um, and, and, and resuscitations of classical thought that that were skeptical in nature and, and, and raised the question of the problem of what we know and how we know. Uh, Montaigne put it on a medal, right? Says, what do I know? It's fundamental. But both of these writers in their different genres, uh, I think, made those questions um, hit home and resonate probably easier to do in the theater where you have an audience and get all that energy. But Montaigne's essays have been selling since he published them. So he's, he, he resonates as well. That's a great question. Um, my, my sense is people, people ask those questions, um, but they, they articulated them 
better than, than anybody else. This is why we care about them, I think. Well, I want to thank uh, Peter Platt and Philippa Kelly for an illuminating conversation tonight. And I want to encourage everyone to keep questing, keep inquiring, uh, keep coming back to our programs, go to Cal Shakes and get on their e-list so you know all about what's happening there in the theater. Uh, I know that the theater will be opening up soon. Uh, and we look forward to going to the theater and uh, being with you, Philippa, on site in the future. Can't wait. And Peter, thank you for all your great work, your scholarship, and your, your delving into all these incredible questions. And uh, I say to everyone, a fair thee well. Until next time. It's one, one thing, uh, can I say, no. just one thing. I, I yes. apologize for the price of the book. Um, there is a 30% discount available, but it's also going to come out in paperback late this year, early next year, if you want to wait. I can't control this, but this is the first time I've ever written a uh, scholarly book where there is a paperback built in. So um, it's coming later if you want. Uh, and thank you for coming. I really, really appreciate it. It means a lot. Great. How about some applause? Yay. Yeah. So everybody can unmute uh -oh. and uh -oh. say goodbye. Say their goodbyes. And what a wonderful audience. Thank Gosh, you. I, it's just Great. so... I, I'll be listening to this recording and, and thinking about all the questions mm -hmm. and wondering what questions people might have yeah, had yeah. if you didn't ask one. Yeah. Thank you. And, and we'll be re we'll be reading Shakespeare with uh, new 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 hearts and minds after this discussion for sure. Well, it's clear that Montaigne wrote Shakespeare now. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. It's great night. seeing you. Thank you. Okay. Good night. I'm closing the doors. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.